Thank you all for joining us. So special to see, especially during these times, how many people want to learn, have a thirst to learn, and actually are learning. Tonight's program, it's quite remarkable. I, I need to share this with you. Earlier, about two hours earlier, there were over 1,700 people who had registered for this event. Beyond, beyond, beyond expectations. Unbelievable. And this is for a Kishabav program. Beyond heartwarming to see the sheer volume of people who are attending this program and the incredible numbers who have registered for this Tishabav and in fact for all of our online program. And each week the numbers keep growing. Thank you to each of you. Please God, it will contribute to the hastening of the coming of Mashiach, the rebuilding of the Beis Amigdash, and the Gula Shalem of Bimheir of Yomainu. Without further ado, Shindler's List, A Daughter's Recollection and Experiences, Tally Nates in conversation with Rob Katz, two individuals who are already so familiar to our audience. Rob Katz, Group CEO of Peregrine, a listed financial services company on the JSE, founder of the Shoshana Foundation, an organization that helps single Jewish mothers and orphans. Rob, thank you as always. Tally Nates, the founder and executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center. Tally is a world-renowned Holocaust historian who lectures internationally on Holocaust education, genocide prevention, reconciliation, and human rights. She has presented at many conferences, including at the United Nations. Tally has been awarded many different awards the world over. She has published many articles and contributed chapters to different books. But perhaps most importantly, for tonight's purposes, she is born to a family of Holocaust survivors. Tally's father and uncle were saved by Oscar Schindler. Thank you, Tally, in advance for agreeing to share this very personal story with all of us this evening. Thank you to all of you for attending. but sad music of Oifem Pribicek, the Yiddish song of pre-Holocaust Eastern Europe. Oifem Pribicek means by the fireplace. It's a song that is describing a rabbi teaching young Jewish children the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph Bet. And in the fourth verse of this song, the third line, it says, Wiffel, how much? In the oasis, in the letters, liegen Tränen. Wiffel in the oasis, liegen Tränen. How many tears lie in these letters? And what the song is really hinting about is that the history of the Jews is written in tears. Written in tears. We've just read Eicha, the book of Lamentations, and how true is, is that statement. Talinates, your father came from the Jewish world of yesterday. Grew up in Poland as a young man before the Second World War. We've just saw some pictures of pre-war Eastern Europe during the rendition of the song, Oifem Prebicek. Tali, tell us about your father's history in Poland before the Second World War. So first of all, Rob, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for your invitation, Rabbi uh, Zulberg. Thank you very much for the partnership. Uh, I'm honored today to speak about my father, my family, uh, and uh, 
to tell you a little bit about this old life in Poland. Uh, my father was, uh, his name was Moses Turner. I will show you some pictures uh, very soon, but sadly, I have no picture of the family from before the war. Nothing survived. I only have pictures from 1945 on. So that is also part of what was lost. Not only lives were lost, but memories through photographs, artifacts, family, uh, uh, mem you know, uh, things that you cherish, that you have, are uh, no, no longer uh, with, with me. Uh, so my father was born in a small town called Novitag. Novitag is about 20 kilometers from a famous ski resort called Zakopane in the Tatra Mountains of Poland. And uh, it's a small town. There were about 2,700 Jews in the town. Um, and it means basically new market. Uh, that is the, the, the name of the, of the town. Um, the family origins was from, was from Germany, but they moved to Poland um, and they moved to Novitag after the First World War in 1918. And um, they were a family of four children, two girls and two boys. My father Moshe had an oldest brother, Henrik, or his Hebrew name was Hanoch. Uh, he had two sisters, uh, the, the, the one that was born after Hanoch, her name was Hela or Helen. Um, and the little one was Tsaila or Tsila. The mother was Leah, the father was Tzvi, and the a, a, a surname of the family was Turner. Doesn't sound very Jewish, but there are many, many Turners in the Jewish world, specifically in Eastern Europe. And the family uh, was a happy family, middle class. Uh, they uh, followed the Bobov Hasidut uh, movement that is more from that side of Galicia, of sort of Western Galicia. And um, they were Orthodox family, but something terrible happened when my father was two years old. Uh, his father got very, very sick with cancer and uh, trying to save his life, his mom took him to Germany, to Berlin, to their family in Berlin. They operated on him. He came back and soon he passed away. So Leah, my grandmother, uh, was with three little children, the oldest six, then four, and then my father at two years old, and pregnant with Tzila uh, that she gave birth to. So quite a, a, a tragic uh, start of life. Um, just one more thing, maybe, just to, to set the tone and to tell you more about who they were. As I said, they were middle-class family and they, the, the town is in a ski resort area. And the family had a, a fur business. In those days, of course, fur coats were the thing. Uh, and um, after Tzvi, my grandfather, passed away, a Leah's brother came to help to continue to sustain the family business, that the kids will somehow uh, have a stable home as well. Uh, so these were some of the sad, bittersweet memories of, of early childhood of my father. But the family was happy. All the kids went to school, uh, a primary school. They belonged to youth movements uh, in the town and uh, had a very warm and loving family growing up. Tal, just so that we can put context to, to the family. Um, so you say it was a middle-class Orthodox Jewish family in Poland um, who had lost, tragically lost their father. Life couldn't have been easy. And then 
the Germans invaded Poland. What age was your father and your uncle when the Nazis invaded? So um, my, my father was only 14 years old when the Germans invaded the town. By the way, the Germans invaded Novitag already on the 1st of September. Uh, they are very close to the border and the town was taken immediately. The, so close to the German border? Yes. Uh, no, close to Slovakia. And you know oh, okay. that uh, uh, all of Czechoslovakia yes. was taken. So, uh, so right. the, close to the Czech border, sorry. Uh, close to the Czech border that was already part of Germany, part of the Reich. Uh, I will not give a history lesson, but uh, for, for the listeners, uh, uh, you know, the Germans took over Austria, then they took over um, uh, the Sudetenland, and yes. then uh, the whole of basically Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia. And that develops later with Slo Slovakia becoming independent and Bohemia and Moravia uh, fall under the Germans. But um, they are taking over the town and... Uh, they control the town immediately. My father is 14 years old. His older sister is 16. The little one is 12. And his brother is 18 years old. And uh, this family is, you know, has to, they have to, to manage this very new and very frightening situation. Uh, they fall under the general government because, of course, the Germans divided Poland. Poland ceased to exist. So they, the Germans divided Poland into part of it that belonged to the Reich, and then the rest was called the general government. Uh, and Krakow, that is very close, actually, to Novi Targets, it's only about two hours' drive, um, was the capital city of the general government, not, not, uh, not Warsaw uh, anymore. Then um, this little town, of course, has, you know, the Jews have to try and survive what is going on. Sadly, my father is separated from the rest of the family quite soon. Uh, the Nazis take able-bodied men, around 100, in a first sort of selection, but this time for labor. It's early on, it's, it's around 1941. Uh, and my father is taken. Uh, Can I just go back, Tal, just to yes. ask you one question. We know that in Warsaw, in Lodge, in Krakow, there were ghettos set up. Just so that we can understand life in this it, it, a village, shtetl, city, I'm not sure exactly what it is, but were the Jews herded into a ghetto and then your father was taken out or did they all live amongst the Gentiles as normal with the Jews then taken out? Just how did, what happened to the Jews when the Nazis arrived? It's a great question because many times we see this history in a very kind of um, linear uh, kind of way. Exactly. But however, actually uh, in that little town that was not exactly a shtetl, it was bigger than a shtetl, bigger than a village, but but smaller than a city, you know, it, it's a small town. Uh, the ghetto was only established a little bit later and it was established in few streets uh, and they moved all the community to those, you know, to those streets. So until about 1941, you did not have a ghetto. And when you look at Poland, um, ghettos were established in different times. Krakow, also the ghetto was established late only in 1941, but Warsaw and Lodz, Wuj, were established earlier in 1940. So there wasn't a linear way of let's do the ghettos and all the ghettos were established. In that case, the ghetto was established in few streets and all the Jews had to move to those streets. Now I'm going to share um, a, a, two really interesting pictures from the ghetto and those were given to me by a researcher in Poland only a few years ago. The researcher found these documents. Those documents are from the ghetto period. They are the documents of Lea and her daughters Hela, Helen and Sela, Sela Turner in Novitag, Poland. And uh, they are German documents describing the Turner family when they were born, 
uh, you know, where they lived, who they were. Uh, and Rob, you, of course, noticed the red lines over those three pictures. Let I'll me tell just... you what I also noticed, Tal, is that the, your, your grandfather's name was Hirsch. Hirsch is Yiddish for the Hebrew Tzvi. It's the same name. Absolutely. He was a Tzvi Hirsch. Absolutely. Yes. Um, oops. These are, by the way, pictures, sketches of Helen and Silla, or Hela and Silla, the only remaining photographs that they found through relatives after the war. Uh, we will learn later that both Helen, I'm named after here, and I'll tell you more about that, and Silla were murdered a few years uh, later. But let's look at these um, two uh, forms. One is for Henrik Chanoch, uh, and one is for Moises or Moshe Turner without a red line. Okay, so similar, they say who is the mother, who is the father, they are in this town, there is a number, uh, there is some, uh, you know, some documents, but uh, if, we, if we go back to these documents and we see the difference, I immediately ask the, 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 the researcher, what does it mean? And it means really that uh, those we marked is being killed. Uh, they were deported to their death, I'll talk about it later, and they were killed. I will stop here uh, the presentation, I'll speak a little bit more about it, but when you speak about the ghetto, the ghetto was for very little time, it was just for a few months. Uh, and as I said, my father was taken quite quickly. He was in the ghetto for a very, very short time, and he was taken away uh, with the first group of 100 men and boys to Zakopane uh, and to his first concentration camp where he was. And uh, was he with your uncle Henrik? No, no. So, so what is happening in the ghetto? Um, Leah, my grandmother, my two aunts, the little girl, uh, Tzila, and her big sister Helen, or Hela, and uh, my, my uh, uh, uncle, Hanok or Henrik, stay in the ghetto. But there are all the time little selections to labor. So Hanok, for example, Henrik, is taken to few concentration camps in the middle, but always it's for a certain period of time and then he comes back to the ghetto. So for example, he's taken to, a, to Rabka, it's about 10 kilometers from the town, to help build an SS school to train Nazis, SS, in killing and guarding concentration camps. And he's there for a short period, and his task is to build target practice. And his, uh, I'll speak about, he's testifying in war crime trials in Germany later, but one of the things that he sees is those SS trainees practicing on Jews as live practice, as they train to become killers. Um, and all sorts of stories that he was telling me. And then he comes back again to the ghetto. They are separated. My father does not see the rest of the family from 1941. At all. At That's all. it. He will see Henrik, he will yes. be uh, reunited with Henrik, but uh, maybe let me show you uh, where he is. So we spoke about, uh, we spoke about the, um, the two girls that are staying in, uh, in the town with my grandmother. We spoke about uh, those very organized forms that the Nazis are uh, creating. But my father is taken to this very surrealistic, beautiful site that was the site of the 1936 Winter Olympic Games. So in 1936, you had the Berlin Olympic Games, Jesse Owens, Adolf Hitler, all those stories. And you always have Winter Olympic Games. And those were held in Zakopane. 
Now, my father that loved to ski as a boy with his sisters and his brother, and for 14 years of his life, go to Zakopane to ski and to enjoy himself. Can you imagine in 1941, taken to a forced labor camp in the same place? Uh, that was the forced labor camp, hard labor in a quarry, managed by a German company called Stua Company. And this picture is taken in 2004 when me, my brother and my mother um, went to see the sites where my father and his family suffered. Um, and uh, that was the kind of, uh, of, of uh, sort of way, you know, that you can imagine his life uh, in hard labor in Zakopane. And, and, and he suffered terribly there because he was a little boy. He was 14, That's 15 it. years old. And he, was, and, and he had nobody. He, he had nobody, as they say, not a lebedika hunt in the ganze Welt. So it, was, it must have been terrible for him. Absolutely Ab terrible. Absolutely. Now, we do know that uh, obviously your father survived. You wouldn't be here if he, if, if he hadn't. And you, you, you've you made reference to your to your uncle, Henrik, who, thank God, also survived. So we'll come back to to um, to liberation and what happened to your father and uncle post the liberation. But a man appeared in their lives called Oscar Schindler. And um, I want you to tell us about Oscar Schindler um, simply because I, I don't believe that uh, that everybody on this call is aware of Schindler. I think a lot of people are, I think made famous by the movie, but there, there certainly are people who are not. So Tal, if you could spend um, literally two minutes just telling our audience uh, who Schindler was and what he did, and then we'll get back to your personal story. Absolutely. So again, for those that uh, would like to see a little photo of Schindler, let's uh, quickly have a look. This is Oscar Schindler with his wife, Emily. Uh, and uh, Oscar Schindler was born in 1908. He died in 1974. Uh, he was born in uh, the Sudetenland, in Zwitau. And uh, he was from a middle class, a, a, a Roman Catholic, uh, married Emily, never had children, and was an adventurous person. He very quickly uh, started to spy for the Nazis. Uh, he had all sorts of adventures in his life. And in, in, in 1939, he joined the Nazi party, went to Krakow, and uh, took a factory from, that was owned by Jews, turned her to a to a, a factory for a, a pots and pens and, 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 and uh, uh, the factory was called Emilia. And uh, he um, took slave laborers that were Jews. He had about 400 Jews uh, working in, in his factory. Of course, they were not paid. He paid the SS for, uh, for, their, uh, for their work. And in a way, uh, he starts as a perpetrator. You know, he doesn't kill anyone. He's a very, very nice person, but he deals with the SS. Uh, you see him here in the center in his uh, 34th birthday. He, is, uh, uh, he loves life. He is uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a friendly kind of, uh, of person. And... Uh, what is interesting about Oskar Schindler is that he changes. In other words, even though he starts as a perpetrator, he really is a, 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 a person that loves life, loves people, and is open to see people as human beings. And very quickly through his factory, he starts seeing his 400 workers as human beings as men, as women, as children. Uh, and maybe Rob, you remember scenes from the movie where, you know, it's his birthday and the workers are giving him a cake and one of the kids is giving him a kiss and so on. And he doesn't see the Nazi ideology as the one that defines his life. And that's what allows him to change from a perpetrator to someone that rescues in the end, 1,200 Jews, amongst them my father and my uncle. In the Gomorrah 
tell in Sanhedrin, it says, if you save a life, it's as if you've saved an entire world. And, you know, I think it's, it, it will be important to say that Schindler was honored by Yad Vashem as a righteous amongst the nations, and he's buried in Yerushalayim. Is that correct? Absolutely. He is uh, buried on Mount Zion. Uh, he died in October um, of, 19, uh, of 1974. He asked to be buried in Jerusalem, and he is buried on, in the Catholic cemetery on Mount Zion. Uh, I visited his grave many, many times. I visited it with uh, people that were on the list together with my father, and it's very emotional. It's actually a really emotional thing because it's, of course, the only grave in a Catholic cemetery that has little stones on it. And always there are little stones on it because of the many, many people that are coming and owing their life to, to this man. Yeah. When we say uh, it saves a life, it's as if you save the whole world. Do you know, well, I suppose it's, all, it's, it's difficult to know as, as descendants, we make more descendants, but do you roughly know how many um, descendants there are that have been saved by Schindler today? You or know, when last you had a number? You know, Rob, in the end of uh, Schindler's list that was done, I remind everyone, in 1993, that is 27 years ago, um, Steven Spielberg quoted the number of 6,000 people that are owing their life now, you know, in 1993 um, uh, yeah. to Oscar Schindler. So you, you are better in accounts than me, and I'm wondering, you know, what okay, would you 6, say? 6,000 in 1993, let's, let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's okay. double. It's probably double today yeah. because it's generation. It's more than another Unbelievable. generation. Unbelievable. After. His, his memory should be a blessing. Absolutely. Tal, now let's join the dots. Your father was in this labor camp as a young boy. Um, we know that the topic of, of this discussion is your recollections of your, of, of your father and, and, and of your uncle. Zechel um, Ivrocha. How did your father and uncle get onto the famous Schindler's List? So Rob, allow me to tell you just for a few minutes and to, to all of you, the listeners, um, a little bit of what is connecting the dots. What is happening to my grandmother? What is happening to my aunts at that time? How do they all meet, you know, my uncle? And what I will do is I'm going to tell you very quickly a journey I made with my brother Amir and with my mother Judith Yehudit in 2004 to, as I said, to Zakopane, but also to Novitag. And we went to see what happened to the rest of the family because in the end of August of 1942, the Nazis ordered all the Jews of the town to go to the football stadium that you see still a football stadium in the left side of the picture. And in that football stadium, they did a selection. They separated between my grandmother, my aunts, and my uncle. My father, as I said, was still in Zakopane. He was not there. They separated them on the football stadium. They took some of those that were separated to the Jewish cemetery on your right and shot them into a mass grave. About 2,500 are, are there in a the mass grave. And the rest, they crossed the road from the football stadium to the train station. And the cattle cars were waiting. And on the 30th of August of 1942, they were all taken to Belgians. And they were taken to the Belgians killing center. We have no pictures from Belgians because Belgians in the east side of Galicia, in the east side of Poland, next to the shtetl of Helm, next to the town of Zamosh. Uh, Belgians existed only from March to December of 1942. And in Belgium, almost half a million Jews were murdered in 10 months. There were only five people that escaped Belgians. 
And only I'll one... Just on, a, on a factual point, can I ask you a factor? In Auschwitz, we know that the, um, the victims that, were, that were, were, were killed in Auschwitz were not only Jews, they were by far the majority of Jews. But when you talk um, Belgians now, are you talking 100% Jews or were there others killed as well? It's a great question. I would say 99% Jews. In that part, there were some Roma and Sinti, what the Nazis called Gypsy, but very few, about, about 5,000. And very few Polish Catholic that were killed. So this killing site or killing center was almost 100% Jewish killing. Very similar to Sobibor, to Chelmno, and uh, to Treblinka. Not like Auschwitz and not like Majdanek. You are very, yeah. very right. Um, so as I said, in Belgium, only five escaped the camp. Only one survived the war. So, so I mean, to understand the Holocaust, you understand Belgians. Half a million dead, one survivor. That is the Holocaust. Now, in 2004, we were invited to the opening of the new memorial site that is very moving, was uh, uh, established by uh, a partnership with the American Jewish Committee, and it has the names of all the towns and all the places where the Jews were taken from to Belgians and were killed in the guest chambers of Belgians. And you see on the left, the town where my family came from. Uh, and, uh, uh, sorry, and, um, and where, uh, what happens is that they are taken from Novitag to Belgians and they're murdered there. Now, my uncle is separated in the football stadium, and he's taken to another camp. I told you he was taken from one camp to another, he's taken to another little camp, and from there he's taken to Plashov. Plashov is the camp that you know from Schindler's List. Plashov concentration camp, right in the outskirts today of Krakow, uh, was a, a camp that was established in 1942 and really grew and became a huge camp with more than 20,000 prisoners in 1943 after the, the liquidation of the Krakow ghetto and the movement. And we see it in Schindler's List, you know, how the, the girl with the red dress, maybe you remember, liquidation of the Krakow yeah. ghetto and then moving everyone to, to, to Plashov. So my uncle, Henry... I'll tell you just, just one sec, and, and that is mm -hmm. that... You know, I'm sure that, that you will echo what I say. The sadness of what you've just talked now about Plushoff concentration camp is that last, um, last August, I went on a Masora tour, um, Rabbi Pesach Kron and Rabbi Ari Shaf, uh, to, to Plushoff, and there's absolutely nothing there. there. There is nothing to see, but nothing. So, absolutely. you know, wh while you talk about how big it was and how many Jews were there and how people suffered there, today... The, the, there is absolutely nothing. You see a, a, a piece of field. You yeah. can't get any feel for the horror of what happened. Absolutely. Yeah, there are only some memorials and they are going to create a museum, but, um, but not at the moment. So you're right. It's, it's um, many of the camps. So, so, so Rob, I don't know you, if you know, but there were four, about 42 or 43,000 camps in Europe. Uh, some of them were little slave labor camps, some of them were factories, some of them were concentration camps. Of course, you had killing sites and killing centers and, 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 and ghettos that were also camps uh, at times or factories in ghettos. Plashov was one of them and quite a big one, a large one. There were men and there were women. It was a mixed camp. Uh, and, and, and my father was there for... for almost two years in, in, in my uncle. So it was, it was a very vicious camp. 8,000 people were murdered inside the camp. This was not a camp that was, you know, in Auschwitz. It wasn't a killing camp, camp with gas chambers. And yet 8,000 people were just shot and hanged uh, in the camp. Uh, and the camp existed for just over two years. Um, so, so when Henrik arrives uh, at the camp, and, and as I said, people are working really hard labor in the camp. I, I met many survivors from that camp. And um, it, it, it was horrific. The conditions were really, really horrific. They had a commandant, Amon Goeth, 
that was sadistic. He was actually a, 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 a man that enjoyed killing. He, uh, you know, practiced uh, sort of long shots from his balcony in his, in his house, killing people for pleasure. My uncle tells me stories of him in the camp working because he was a builder and he used to build barracks. And Emon Goeth walking around with a gun and uh, basically stopping and he fe felt like killing someone and just killing someone. And my uncle told me an incident where he was working next to a person. He heard a shot and the person next to, me, to him, the man next to him, just fell dead. And it was so close to my uncle. And everyone was so petrified that it will happen to them. Now, one day, my uncle hear that a group of prisoners is supposed to come from Zakopane, from the Stuag labor camp. He knew that my father was in Stuag. He doesn't know if my father survived. And he waits to see if my father arrives. And this is one of the most emotional moments that my uncle told me about, because he said, and there, you know, the, 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 the trucks arrived and the prisoners um, arrived into Plashov and suddenly he sees my father that is wow. two, uh, two years older already. He's 16, 17. And they, they look at each other and, and, and you know, and they, they, they hug each other and they cry and they ask, where is mom? And where is Hela? And where is Sila? And what is going on? And tell me. And of course, they don't know. They don't know what happened to, to the girls in their family. And they, he asks my father, what happened to you? And my father says, you know, um, I had hernia operation without anesthetic in Zakopane because I was carrying those stones, but I survived it. And then they say, well, we will then survive anything. And we are going to stick together. And whatever happens to us, we're going to do it together. And they swear never to part. Um, and as you said, this is Plush of Today. This is Plush of Today. It's a memorial site. It has a few memorials. This one is from the communist time uh, when Poland was under the communist regime and there are some other, you know, other, but that's where they are in Plaszow. Yes. Now, now, Schindler and the connection to, 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 your, to your dad and to your uncle, maybe tell while you're answering the question, you can tell us, you know, what happened to your dad after the war and did he have a relationship with Schindler after the war? Absolutely. So, so um, Schindler had the factory in Krakow, in Podgorza, next to the, the um, maybe uh, for those that don't know, let me very quickly uh, show a picture of, uh, of the entrance to the factory. That was uh, on the left uh, uh, in 2004 and uh, on the right with a group of UCT student leaders that um, I took in 2018, December, November, December 2018. And today it is a museum, uh, the Oskar Schindler Museum. So um, Oskar Schindler had this factory in Krakow and he saved the Jews uh, many, many times uh, from, he, he let them sleep in their factory when there was a, when there were trouble, when uh, the Emon Goeth was shooting people in Plashov, he would keep them in the factory overnight. Then the factory moved, uh, moved uh, to, to uh, a, a, the factory workers had to move to Plashov and walk from Plashov to the factory. My uncle and my, um, my father joined the group of workers only in 1944 and only when it is the new factory. So not in Krakow, Remember, they were never in Krakow. They were never in the ghetto. They only joined in the end of 43, 44 to Plashov. What happens to Oskar Schindler? He realizes that 
the Nazis are going to close the clash of camp in 1944, and they're going to send everyone to other concentration camps or to Auschwitz. And uh, what happens is that he decides to save the Jews. He tries to convince other industrialists, other factory owners to do the same, none of them is brave enough or crazy enough to do it because Oskar Schindler is full of adventurous, adventurous spirits. He's willing to take risks. He's willing to take chances. And he convinced the Nazis to create a factory next to his hometown in the Czech side in a place called Brunlitz. He creates the factory and he moves 1,000 of his workers, so 400 of the original workers and 600 new workers. Uh, the, the workers grew, the, there was growth in the workers, but more workers, let's say, um, to the new factory in Brunlitz. My father and my uncle are moving with him to Brunlitz and they are on the list. So let's look at the list. Let's have a look at the list. This is page 10 from what we know as Schindler's List. Uh, the, there were many lists and I don't have time to explain again historically what happened. This is the list that was the important list of who went to Brunlitz. So the 1,000 men, women and children that went to Brunlitz. It's a list of about 22 pages. My father and uncle, uh, can you see my arrow? Yes. Do you see Turner Moses? Yes, Moshe, yes. Okay. Yeah, Bernard. Uh, so Turner Moses, born in June 1924, and Turner Henrik, born in October, of 1920. Both of them are described as builders or assistant builders and they uh, are joined to the list. They are taken to Gross Rosen camp, concentration camp, for about three weeks. The women are taken to Auschwitz. Schindler is sending one of his actually mistresses to Auschwitz to get them out, uh, not like in the film. And uh, after three weeks they are uh, the men are taken from Gross Rosen to Brunlitz and they are in Brunlitz for about 10 months, 11 months with Oskar Schindler and with his wife, Emily. Uh, the new concentration camp supposed to create ammunition and arms, but they never create anything. Oskar Schindler vows not to create weapons for the Nazi war machine. So basically, whatever they create is rubbish. They cannot use any of it. He buys everything on the black market, gives it to, SS, to the SS, and basically in those almost a year, you know, from beginning of October to, the, to, to May, they are there to basically survive, survive the war. He used all the money that he made to get food, to get, uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, that uh, winter of 1944 was the coldest winter um, until that time. Uh, and the, Europe was starving. It was the hunger winter, it was called. And uh, Europe was starving, there was no food, but he was getting food. And then he saved another 200 people from a, an abandoned train that he found not far from uh, Brunitz. So all in all, he saved 1,200 people. Amazing, amazing. And tell at the end, did, did, did your father have a, a, an enduring relationship with the man afterwards? What happened so, to your father? He, he, he was liberated and yeah, I suppose so, so, he landed up in, in what was then Eretz Israel before it became Medinat Israel. Absolutely. So, so maybe again, let me share um, the first picture that I have of my father. The first picture, so I don't have my father as a baby. I don't have my father as a teenager. I have my father at the age of 19, basically. Uh, he is here on the right. 
And this is taken immediately a few, few months after liberation. Uh, I can see he's very, very thin still. And these are his friends from the list. Uh, so he is with them. And uh, he, uh, he's, he, they, they are liberated by the Russian army on the 9th of May, 1945. So immediately after the war is over. And uh, he decides to stay in Germany. And this is an interesting story. He has no education. 1st of September, 1939 was supposed to be his first day of high school. And he never went to high school. So the UN, the newly established UN in 1945, offered survivors education. And he went to Germany to learn to become an auto mechanic, fix cars, basically, and graduated in 1950 uh, with a, a diploma, with a, a college diploma. So, so he did his high school and, 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 uh, and, his, uh, in, and his diploma. His brother Henrik, my uncle, went back to the town to Novitag to see if uh, the family survived. And of course, found out that no one survived. They had only one distant cousin actually that survived. No one, not grandparents, not uncles, not cousins, no one survived, only the two brothers. But more than that, a year later, uh, um, there was a pogrom. There were massacres in Poland by right-wing nationalists that uh, killed Jews. The, the famous one, of course, is Kielce. But there was one, there was one also in 1945 uh, in Novitag, where five Jews were killed that came back. They survived the Holocaust, came back to the town, and were killed. And my uh, uncle decided to sell the house. Their house was uh, n not standing anymore. It was demolished uh, through the... The, the, the Nazis demolished it, but a very kind Polish name, neighbor agreed to buy the, 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 the plot from him and paid him fully, a fully whatever the plot was worth. And uh, that was all they had, the, whatever, $500 or whatever it was, you know, the equ equivalent, they divided between them. Uh, my uncle then were part of the Bricha, uh, uh, the uh, illegal immigrants that tried to get to Palestine. He was one of the organizers. He was smuggling people through the mountains, through the Alps. Uh, he himself was caught by the British because, of course, in those days, uh, the British uh, controlled, uh, it, it, they had the, uh, the mandate of, uh, over Palestine. And he was sent to Cyprus and again was in a camp yes. on the island of Cyprus. And the only silver lining is that he met his wife, his dear wife, who ah. uh, did in Cyprus. She was a survivor from Romania, from Trans Transnistria, from the camps in Ukraine, Romania. And uh, um, they, they, they got married. So that's the silver lining. And I have a cousin, Zvi. My brother, stay, uh, my, my father, uh, as I said, stayed uh, in Germany. And then he um, decided to, to, um, to go to Palestine when he finished his, uh, uh, to Israel. Israel was born already. And he decided to go to Israel. Um, at that time, they were not in touch in, with Schindler. They gave Schindler, uh, do you remember a ring? That is true. They gave him a ring in the end before he went to the American zone and they were liberated by the Russians. And then they helped him uh, after that, they collected some money after the war to uh, send him to Argentina uh, because he believed that he would be an excellent farmer. He wasn't. He failed in absolutely everything that he did. Other than uh, saving Jews. Other than saving Jews, he was a failure in business throughout. He finished his life as an insurance broker and, and as I said, died in 1974. But uh, one more thing that they did was to bring him to Israel. So every year he would come to Israel uh, in the 60s, uh, in, in, in the early 70s, and they will party with him. They will drink and they will laugh. And uh, my father, that was a very scared man, 
was very afraid of closed places and of crowds and had a lot of trauma, um, he used to go and meet Oskar Schindler because he loved him and he loved his wife. He really, really loved them. And uh, I still keep this receipts. He was a, a, we were a poor family growing up. You know, he worked in a garage, in a, in a Volkswagen garage. You know, he, he was a very interesting man, my father. He, he believed that, uh, you know, the new generation can, you know, you, you need to forgive the new generation, that you cannot generalize, that, you know, that you cannot put everyone in a box. He was a very interesting, reflective person. Yes my father, yes. uh, but he went to see Schindler every time that he went. Oh, so he had tremendous Akkore Satov for, for Schindler. Absolutely, absolutely. How, um, the Klausenberger Rebbe, Zachar Tzadik Livrocha, when asked how he said, Klausenberger Rebbe, for our viewers, lost a wife and 11 children to the Nazis and rebuilt his life. Uh, probably the most famous Hasidic uh, Rebbe to survive the, 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 the Holocaust. When asked towards the end of his life how he managed to, 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 to rebuild, he responded that through his silence he lived. A year ago to this night, on Tisha B'Av night at the Bay Shul, um, I interviewed Maud Pearl of Tully, who you know very, very well, and Maud also from, from an early age until recently, until about five years, he, he also couldn't speak about what he went through um, in uh, leaving, um, uh, surviving Lithuania literally two weeks before the Nazis arrived and, and surviving the Russian gulags in, in, in Siberia. So he also couldn't speak until very late in his life. Your father and uncle, by your, by your own uh, um, disclosures earlier, what your uncle had seen, Loa Lainu, one, one of each and every person and their, and, their, and their family should never see what your uncle had to see when he was a young, young boy and, and your father, ex what he experienced. Were they able to talk about, uh, about what, what happened or were they like Maud Perlov and the Klausenberger Rebbe who just couldn't talk about it? So it's a very important question for descendants, you know, and for, for children of survivors. What, what did we hear? And did our parents speak? So it's interesting. The two brothers dealt with it very, very differently. My uncle spoke all the time. He wrote his memoir. He wrote, he wrote poetry, he spoke to schools. He loved the fact that I loved history, that I asked questions. Every time he saw me, he said, the Medele, the Medele, that, you know, that wants to hear the stories, you know, because I was the one that loved history and wanted to hear the stories from very young age. I wanted to know. And he used to tell me the stories. I was the, really the only one that was interested. It's interesting also in every family, usually there's one that is interested. My brother was not as interested. My cousin was not as interested. I was the one that was all the time asking the questions. My father, that of course was much younger. He was 14 when it all started, was very traumatized and did not speak. In Plashov, uh, my father was what you call a zonde commando. He had to, un to take out the, the, the corpses from the mass graves and burn them. And that was such a traumatic experience for him that I think it closed him from being able to speak about any of his experiences. So as a little girl, I remember him, you know, having nightmares. I remember him, you know, being very, uh, very depressed or, or, or very, um, you know, Rabbi, uh, the Rabbi just spoke about depression, about Churchill and, and other things. So, so my father had that depression, this trauma from the ho horrible, horrible things that he, he witnessed and he had to do you know, as a young teenager. Um, so he was afraid. He did not speak. During the Eichmann trial, I was not born, but I was born immediately after. But during the Eichmann, Eichmann, Eichmann trial, he started to speak to my mother. So she knew more, but he did not speak. So a lot of the stories, I know from him very little stories, and a lot of the stories I know from my uncle. And I'm very grateful to my uncle that told me all those stories. 
Amazing, amazing. I think it's important, um, Tal, that our viewers do know that you are the founder and curator of the Holocaust Center in Johannesburg. Um, from the base relationship with the center, um, you have a passion and a fire um, for keeping the memory of victims of the Holocaust and genocide aside. And just spending the last hour with you in this discussion has shed a little bit of light on what um, what the, the the fire and the passion and the power that you have to 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 spread what is such an important message for the world, especially um, during this time. Tal, it's been my absolute privilege talking to you. Really, I don't think anyone on this webinar is not seriously touched and moved by your story, by your father's story, by your uncle's story by their whole families, their memory should be, be a, a blessing. Um, Hashem Yenachem Demam, and Hashem should give you, Clive, and your two children, and your family, much brocha and strength to carry on the, the brilliant work that you do. And once again, on behalf of the base and its community, I'm going to hand back to the rabbi, but a very big thank you, A, for the time you spent, B, for the time in preparation, and C, for the um, deep emotions uh, that you shared with us, which I think will be with all of us for, for many, many years to come. Thank you very, 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 very much indeed. Thank Rabbi. you. Thank you, Tali. Thank you, Rob. Tali, so many emotions, so many feelings, so many lessons. I wish we had uh, more time to, to continue. So much to learn and so appropriate, especially on, on Tisha B'Av. Rob, what can I say? Your professionalism is beyond evident. Thank you as always. To both of you, thank you not only for tonight, thank you for all the effort that went into tonight and for all that you do in general for our community. It's greatly appreciated. I also want to mention, as Rob mentioned, that um, in fact, this is the third event done in partnership with the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center together with Tali. And this certainly is an honor for the base community. And we look forward to our next event together in the next few weeks and we certainly look forward to further development, to the further development of this very special relationship. In conclusion, Tali, you know, you mentioned your father was reflective. And in fact, the one feeling that I, I kept feeling throughout was a feeling of tremendous gratitude uh, for the life that we have, or for the life that I have, as a result of the contrast of our lives versus the life that was. One of the benefits for all of us, in my opinion, and these are in my opinion, in looking to the past is certainly that it really magnifies all the many reasons we all have in the present to be grateful. And so in truth, there is no doubt, especially for all of us who are removed a couple of times, there's no doubt that looking to the past may on some level be depressing or perhaps even, you know, you can understand why it is called lamentations looking back to certain parts of our past. But in reality, if we contrast it to our present and we contrast it to our future, it results in a tremendous positivity and optimism, which is really the point at the end of the day. Please God, as a result of all of our efforts, as a result of our introspection and the utilization of this day that is Tisha B'Av, we should all see the Gaula Shalema, the complete redemption. Thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Rob. Thank you again, Talib.